Does Susie Orban actually recommend irrevocable trust? Ooh, that seemed weird to me. And uh, as much as Susie Orman just you know, grates on me, I kind of believe she said that everyone should have an irrevocable trust, or as a highfalutin attorney say, irrevocable, irrevocable. If you say irrevocable, that means you're a good estate planner. I just say irrevocable and revocable for a living trust. So I, I went online. I just said, let's do a quick research thing on SusieOrman.com, and we come up with why everyone needs a uh, living revocable trust not and it, and we'll re read this for a second because uh i, I was i was going to be stunned if she recommended an irrevocable trust uh all right so ever this is based uh 2013 everyone needs a living trust says susie in response to the blah, blah, blah. okay unlike a will a living trust will cover you while you're still alive you must think about what if something happens and you become ill or incapacitated who is going to take care of you and pay your bills? A key difference between a will and a living revocable trust is that the living trust has incapacity clause that states who you want to sign for your affairs in the event you are unable to do so for yourself. Be mindful of the difference between a revocable trust and an irrevocable trust. An irrevocable trust cannot be modified or terminated without permission of the beneficiary. The beneficiary, not the grantor. Not the trustee, the beneficiary. I would argue the trustee probably has a little bit more uh, ability to uh, to manip uh, manipulate. The wrong word uh, to change things a little bit more so because the, the trustee is granted some powers for sure. But either way, once the grantor transfers the assets to an irrevocable trust, he or she removes all rights to the ownership of that trust, and that's literally all she says. So that's odd to me. So again, I've, I've done a video on this before, but just the fact that some guy asked me. Uh, what do I think about Susie Orman's recommendation on the irrevocable trust? That, that doesn't make any sense to me at all. All right, so she, she talks about a living trust or an inter vivos trust, an RLT. If you're just looking for the acronyms, we got living trust, inter vivos trust, revocable trust, revocable living trust, and RLT. Those five different ways. It's all the same thing. And a trust is just a document that you said, I am the grantor. I'm going to give some money or some asset to this living trust in order for the trustee of who I am to manage it. I'm going to set up terms in there that says at the end of the day, if I'm in incapacitated or if I'm in the hospital or if I'm out of the country, uh, my co-trustee or my successor trustee can step in and manage this trust on my behalf. Hey, hold on just one. Susie's right about the issue with the trust uh, being able to provide you in case you're incapacitated. Um, that, that's true, without question. The drawback is the only asset that trust controls are the assets that are in the trust. <laughs> trust does not control the biggest assets you have, which are probably going to be your 401k, TSP, IRAs, and whatnot. And most people's homes are not in living trust either. So a trust in of itself doesn't stop that from, I mean, just because you have a living trust, you've named issues if you become incapacitated. Uh, if a... <laughs> If an asset isn't titled in the trust, it's meaningless. If the trust speaks not at all to anything that's not titled in the trust. So the easiest way around that is a durable power of attorney. And I've, again, I've done the video on this before, but it's so important. A durable power of attorney establishes uh, someone to ma manage your financial affairs in lieu of you being incapacitated. It's just that simple. A, du a durable power of attorney survives incapacity. A general power of attorney stops at incapacity. There's a third power of attorney, a springing power of attorney, which only uh, kicks in during incapacity. You don't want the springing one, in my opinion, because the springing one, you have to get a doc to sign off that you're incapacitated for the powers to be exercised by your agent, in fact, or attorney, in fact, or whoever the representative, whatever you want to call it. I don't care. A durable power of attorney, though, you also want to be careful that you don't have, you have to get two or uh, one or two docs to sign off that you're incapacitated because what if those docs are on vacation? What if the docs don't know you? What if the docs are I, just all kinds of different things? I mean, you think a doctor signing his name to a document that says, I'm going to allow Charlotte, who I don't know, to have access to Josh's financial accounts uh, just because Charlotte showed me some document that said Josh is incapacitated. That, I mean, you got to think about it from a doc's perspective. So a durable power of attorney you want to do with someone just who you trust implicitly because essentially you're literally signing away your documents. You're saying, I give you the ability to access my accounts right now. You can go and blow out that money and uh, move to the Bahamas. I'll never see you again. Uh, so we got to be careful with that. But I, you know, just at the end of the day, the living trust, the same thing. You're naming a co-trustee, someone who managed the trust with you, generally it's a spouse, 
and then a successor trustee uh, to manage it in, if you're incapacitated. Again, for the successor trustee to have powers to act on your behalf, that person has to need to validate with uh, with the person who holds the, the asset, the Vanguard, or you know, I guess a probate court, that you are in uh, jeopardy, you're incapacitated, I mean, and that person is a rightful a person to act on your behalf if you're incapacitated. Not a, a bunch of, a lot of hoops there jump through. Uh, so I'm surprised that that's all Susie, Susie Orman stated on that. It, um, I, I I don't agree with that in the least. I mean, because I actually I think if anything, what Susie makes it, she discounts the fact uh, that the vast majority of your assets aren't going to be titled in living trust. It can't. You can't remove an IRA. You can't name your IRA, uh, change the name of your IRA to a living trust. That'd be a distribution which is 100% taxable as ordinary income. And if you're before the age of 59 and a half, that's 10% penalty as well. You just can't do that. If you have a joint account, um, you can't have a joint IRA either. All right. So because of that. The only way for an IRA to be uh, have capacity issues is with a durable power of attorney. That would be your best bet for sure. A living trust can be the, the beneficiary of your IRA, but the beneficiary of the IRA only kicks in when you die. And so the living trust doesn't do anything for your IRA and 401k. Um, it does avoid probate for sure. A living trust avoids probate. So if you have money at a local bank and you want to make sure it doesn't go through probate and you don't want to name a POD, a payable on death or a TOD, a transfer on death for the brokerage account, uh, you can absolutely put the living trust, uh, the bank account in your living trust. Absolutely. It'll be probate avoidance, but TODs and PODs do all that anyway without no fuss, no muss. It's easy. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, and privacy. Privacy is a big one. I mean, that's a fact. Privacy does kick in. I don't want, uh, you know, who was Aretha Franklin died and she didn't have a will. So everything went through probate and we knew who was going to be the beneficiaries or the benefactors, I guess, of the estate, according to the probate law uh, and, and the probate courts. Excuse me. So if you want that, keep that private, a living trust would do that for you. Uh, but so will beneficiary designations and TODs and PODs as well. Anything that bypasses probate. A probate avoidance tool, i.e. a beneficiary designation, uh, will be kept private as well. So lots of ways to avoid uh, having the need of a living trust. If you have multiple jurisdictions of real estate, living trust will probably be helpful for sure. You know, I got a house in Tennessee, a house in Maine, a house in Georgia. Uh, I have to, my heirs have to probate all three. So if I put them in living trust, literally what a living trust is, I'm going to go to the probate court and retitle it while I'm alive. So that way my kids don't have to do it while I'm dead. Uh, he's not avoiding probate. Someone's going to probate to retitle the asset in the, uh, or a court, at least a county court to retitle the asset in the trust. I mean, that's happening, but I guess you could do it when it's more convenient for you than at, you know, after you, you know, mom died and now your kid's got to fly in from Seattle, uh, to probate some house in Loudoun, Tennessee or something like that. Anyway, so uh, just be advised, don't get too caught up in, in living trusts. Don't avoid estate tax, not at all. And the revocable trusts, a whole different ball of wax. I, you know, unless you have some significant estate uh, tax uh, taxation worried about, I just don't see a huge benefit of it. I just don't. Uh, irrevocable life insurance trusts. In this day and age, with the estate tax the way it is, I, I mean, if you're watching this YouTube channel, it's hard to imagine that you have uh, significant estate tax issues that, uh, that you need to do an irrevocable trust. But yeah, I'll leave that up to you to decide. All right, we'll see you next time.